Welcome to the podcast that's dedicated to helping business owners prepare their business for exit so you can maximize the valuation and exit on your own terms. This is the Exit Insights podcast presented by Succession Plus. I'm Daryl Bates Brownsort, and today I've got Rhett guest Ray Brown. Ray's from a business called Archibiz, and Ray specializes in working with architectural practices to help them get exit ready, increase their valuation, make them worth something so that they can get the most from their life's work. Hey, welcome, Ray. Thanks for joining me today. Oh, it's nice to be here. Um, it seems a long time since you and I crossed paths in, in Australia. I don't think if it was anything, don't know if it was anything personal, but when I was coming to Australia with my family, you decided you would go to the UK, but we've caught up again now, so uh, all good. Well, I think, yeah, we, we're both chasing greener grass, perhaps, and uh, <laughs> and I found it in the UK and, and you lost it by going to Australia. <laughs> no, no, Australia has been very good to us. I came here. 17 years ago, been a business coach. And last five years, we've focused on architects with a, a company called Archibus. Um, and the reason we went for architects was that I had a few architect clients already, and they were just very receptive to coaching. They were willing to admit that they, they weren't taught anything about business at university, and they were ready and open to uh, some business advice and some frameworks and ways of thinking about, about business. Uh, so it's been very productive. Brilliant. So, Ray, you've, over the years, you've worked with, with a number of different industries, like a, a lot of business coaches and, and, and been industry agnostic. But you've decided to focus on the architectural world, as you say, because of their receptiveness. What is it you find that, that's different or unique about architectural practices that you need to be aware of specialising in that sector uh, that is subtly or, or maybe not so subtly different to, to other industries? Um, I think it's the the narrative in architecture that, that nobody understands us. Uh, it's been going for a long time, but not as a business. So people really have a weird idea of how it is to run an architectural practice. And the, the, the odd thing is that many of them end up in practice of, in their own. They, they are working for a big firm. Uh, they do some work on the side for a relative or a friend. Then they get overwhelmed with work and they suddenly give up their job and they're in business, whether they like it or not. And yet they've had no experience of, of business. No one's taught them what we call the rules of the game. And they, they can be quite um, naive around business. Uh, if I do good work, that will speak for itself. The phone will ring and we'll be re really busy. And of course, we all know that you've got to go looking for work. You've got to position yourself in the marketplace. Uh, and really, I think the key with architects is the this um, as I say, the narrative that says sometimes architecture good, business is bad. Uh, and that's perpetuated by a lot of the universities who do half a day on business during a, a seven-year course. Uh, and that's the introduc introduction to business for, for these architects who are in business and suffer all the hardships that you and I know about that come from running a business. Yeah. So it's a, it's a very similar story, isn't it? You know, uh, professional heads out on their own because they, they want to make a difference. They want to work with their own clients. They want to have a say in how things are done. And they're often talking operationally, um, you know, which is I'm good at my product. If I'm really good at my product, then people will see the work I do and, and they'll come you know, flocking in uh, to the yep. doors and, and they'll be queuing up. And as, as you allude to, that it, it's not as easy as that. And yeah, but that's a similar story in all, all professions. Yeah. And I think we can categorize that and go, that's a similar story in a lot of uh, businesses where this, they provide a professional service or a service professionally. Um, yeah. What about architecture? Are there any particular rules or regulations that make it you know, hard for anyone to run a, a, an architectural practice? Um, it excludes anyone from running or owning an architectural uh, business? Not really. I think they, they have a lot of rules and regulations but they, they tend to um they tend to worry about that and they tend to be have a bit of the victim mentality you know i'm sure you're the same as me but if if you had a dollar for every time someone said to you ray what you don't realize is is our industry and my business is more complicated than most okay when the, the basics are still I had the same. A dollar every time i heard that <laughs> exactly um so the They've got to learn the basics. They've got to learn uh, how to sell the product. Uh, 
how to run a business, the, the basics of finance. So we, we sometimes say to, when we started out, we used an analogy of, of chess and said, you need to learn the rules of the game. And one of my clients said, Ray, it's, it's, it's not that complicated. It's um, think more drafts or checkers. But we've actually come down again since then. And we, the analogy we use is snakes and ladders. Now, I, t I, t I told my 10 year old grandson in sort of 10 minutes how to play snakes and ladders and he loved it. Um, but if I hadn't given him the rules of the game, if I presented him with that board, uh, he just wouldn't, wouldn't have had a clue. And I, and I find a lot of architects, they're really that ignorant about business. And, and for some reason, the industry has made that okay. It's made it okay not to be uh, across the financials or marketing or whatever aspects of business that we all need. Uh, you just got so, to have them to run a successful business. Is that replicated? So as as a, a graduate architect joins an architectural practice, they, they go in, they do their work, and the, the culture or the, the style, the operating uh, mode of that business is that they, they go in, they do their work, and they're not exposed to financials or or they're not exposed to having to win clients or get clients on board until they reach a certain level. Um, and they just you know, maybe get to the point where they feel that, that work just magically arrives because, you know, someone just went and talked to someone and, and, and the work landed in their lap. <clears throat> yep. Well, um, and I think you're absolutely right. I think the, 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 the education that they get through role modeling the, the companies they work for just tends to perpetuate the, the feeling that you don't need the business of good, good work will, will work for, um, speak for itself. Uh, and I had two perfect examples that my oldest client in Melbourne, they worked in a really iconic uh, precinct of the middle of Melbourne, uh, Federation Square. They were really deep in the, in the design side of that. Once that project finished, they set up on their own. And effectively, they sat by the telephone and said, We'd worked on Federation Square. Now the phone should ring. And and those two guys, they, they, when I met them, they were starving. They really were struggling, disillusioned, and really there was unless they did something really uh, significantly to change their business, they would be back working for another practice uh, within months. So let's use those guys as a case study. You haven't named any names. Um, they were let's call it the stereotype. Hey, I'm a professional. I've got all my qualifications. I've I've got a portfolio of, of having done some really good work uh, before. I, I've joined a, another similar person, and and we're a similar mindset. We're both equally as talented as as architects. So therefore, if we start a business together, we've got a great location. Therefore, we should do really well. And they set up, and they, you know, what's the old story? You you sit in and and you wait for the phone to ring. Um, create a website so therefore that's all i have to do i've got effectively a brochure on on the internet <clears throat> people should find me and 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 start queuing up that didn't happen you know maybe they waited six twelve i don't know however long they waited before they said hang on this isn't working for us uh we got bills to pay we got mouths yep. to feed with families we need help something's got to change ring up ray um ray comes in and and what do you do well, I think that the key is to simplify business for people. Take away the um, the scary elements of business. Business. We're an architect, but so we speak a lot about the the transition from technician to leader. Yep. And as a leader, you, as a technician, you're expected to have all the answers. You've been doing something for the last twenty years. Someone gives you a question, whether you're the lawyer or an accountant or an architect, and your job is to answer that question. Once you start running a business, once you start leading people. You can't have all the answers. You need to be asking for advice and asking for help. So what we do in the business is we um, effectively work in, in the four areas, the practice as a whole. How do we make that more efficient and, and make the numbers clearer? We look at the projects and how the projects are run, all at a strategic level. Then we look at the, the people. So how do you manage the people? And the last part, which we're beginning to think is probably the most important part, is your perspective and your perception. Okay, How do you view the market? How do you view your practice? And typically one of our big uh, issues is to try and get them away from the, the scarcity mentality. So there's, a, there's an interesting paradox in architect, 
architecture that we meet every single day. The architects will tell us, uh, we can't get good people, but we don't have enough work in our pipeline. Okay, those two things can't really exist. If there was a shortage of work in the market, there would be plenty of architects to, to employ. Uh, so it's really changing that mindset and getting them to think abundantly, get them to position well in the market so that people know whether they're a top end architect somewhere in the middle or somewhere doing a, a budget role. So the, the normal yeah. business aspects that, that we'd expect in any business. OK, so so you've tapped on one of the key things that, that I think a lot of advisors out there see in, in helping grow a business or, or grow, let's call it a practice and transition it into a business because because that's what we're doing, isn't it? Uh, we're, right. we're, we're changing the mindset is, is if I'm understanding what you're saying is you're grabbing some people and, and you're evolving their thinking from some winning some work and basically finding my own work, aka self-employed, to, to turning that into a business that is a, a slick operating machine that, that work comes in, you know, the people in the business do the work, we, we provide the service to the clients, the clients are happy, and, and that is a perpetuating machine um, that, that grows beyond the, the, the small number of people that, that are just doing that. So if they've got enough work, or they've got more work coming in, then the capacity of the, the machine grows. So now we've got a business rather than just a, a couple of people doing work. And that's the type of practices we're talking about, isn't it? Not, not those people who want to stay small and just um, lifestyle business, self-employed. It's the ones who want to create a business and therefore something that they can hand over or effectively sell and create yeah. value in. Absolutely. And th that's something that's becoming front of mind for a lot of older architectural practice owners. They, they've never thought about succession and what does this look like? Is it a trade sale or do I sell to the next layer? And are the next layer of managers ready to go? Um, and, and we use a structure diagram that, that demonstrates to them, you've got to think like a shareholder, you've got to think like a, a board member. Maybe we'll speak about board separately and then think like an employee. But separate from that, you've got to think of the business as a separate entity. And that, that's the biggest change for most architectural practices. Really? Most uh, practices grow through one person or two or three people, and then they add on helpers as they need them. And, and what yeah. happens in a situation like that is it, it becomes what we call a they business. So if we interview the staff, uh, we say, where's the business going? Where does it fit in the market? Oh, I think they want to grow, or I think they want to get a new office, or I think he wants to develop this side of the practice. And the right. first thing, if you want something that's saleable, is to produce a wee business that, that everybody, people should come and work for the business, not for the individual, because that, that's where the, the, so that's the value really is thing. in building. So for any businesses out there hearing this at the moment, you know, have a listen to the language that, that, that your employees are using. Are they talking as an us-them language or is it a collective we language? If it's we, then the, you've got a business or you've got the, the start of, of a business. If it's us-them, they, you know, they type language, it's, it's more likely to be a self-employed with a number of helpers, which what you're saying is there's the first flag that the business is not likely to be worth a lot. So the first solution that you bring is to go, well, let's start thinking, let's break the business down into the functions. Correct, We've got a shareholder correct. function that needs to be fulfilled. We've got a board function that needs to be fulfilled and, and the board has a certain role, the shareholders have a role. And then we've got that job function. I, I forget the term you used it, but we've got working in the business as, as Gerber called it, you know, where I've where yeah, I've got a job to do, but that's a different hat, a different function to the board hat that I wear and the shareholder hat that I wear. So there's a, exactly uh, something you start with. Yeah, and I think the uh, it's a realization to people that it's the business that has purpose <clears throat> and vision and culture and a yep. strategy. It's not the individual. So having the business with these attributes and the, and the one top of the list for me is um, which is very again paradoxical for architects. Um, we we sometimes say to architects when we meet them at the, at the beginning, can can you show us the drawings for your practice? And they kind of look a bit uh, scans. And what do you mean drawings for the business? Well, what does it look like when it's finished? And the, the penny kind of drops that, that they're, they're, they're building their business one brick at a time. Um, and they've got no vision of the end game or what the, how big it's going to be, how many people. Nothing that the employees and the stakeholders can buy into. And that obviously feeds through into retention, 
planning for the future. And and it is it is weird that architects would think they should, could build a business with no concept of what it looks like when it's finished. Hmm. And yet that's exactly what they do for their clients. Every day. They, they, they do the, um, the briefing meeting and the fact find and all the things that we know about. And then out of that comes this, what we would call an energizing view of the future. And we, we, we build a, a, a pyramid around, you, you've got to get alignment in your practice, alignment around the shareholders, the employees, the, all the stakeholders. So then people can commit and then we can get a degree of anticipation. If, if you don't have that vision, then it's really hard for people. What am I aligning with and what do you want me to commit to? And really, I don't know where we're going. So it's hard to anticipate the future. Yeah. And I notice you're using the language of, and, and maybe I'm, I'm, missing something but you're talking about when people feel aligned to where you're going which yeah. i don't know if you've been doing this deliberately but which is subtly different to i'm bought into where you're going yeah i i think that's right because i think the the, the company um individuals have an individual relationship with the company not with the individual and and i think that that um and sometimes use an analogy of a, a four-legged stool. The employee puts work in and takes money out, and the company puts money in and takes work out. And, and if that's not in balance, and that, that revolves around what's my career going to look like in the future? How much am I going to earn? Will I be able to afford my mortgage? Um, and you don't want that coming from an individual. You want that coming from a well-run, solidly-based company that, that you can... Um, align with the values, you can align with the vision um, and really see your future being um, realized by putting the effort into the company. So Ray, what you've talked about so far is you, you've, the, there's, there's two things that I've heard so far. The first one is, is around uh, the vision and the culture and, and let's call that the style of where the business is going and, and, and the, the, the behavioral style, if you like, of, of their, their standard operating norms of, of how they're going to get there. No architectural skills required for that. This is just, you know, pulling a, a group of people together and inspiring, inspiring them about uh, a compelling future and something that they feel aligned to. Yep. The next thing that you mentioned was, was basically of going, hey, look, there's various functional roles in a business that, that need to be performed. You know, we've got you know, you didn't use the language, but we've got marketing and sales. We need to know who our clients are and how do we how do we reach them? And we, we need to do some focus work on doing sales. The, the clients aren't just going to come and, and, and throw themselves at us. Um, and then I imagine we've got some you know various roles throughout the business. Different people do different things. Um, so you've talked about those two key areas. Are they the main areas you work on in a business or is there, there, there are other areas that you um, see showing up regularly in architectural practices as well? Well, strictly speaking, we, we don't go too deep on any of those, really. We stick at a strategic level uh, because we say to people, we, we are not cons expert consultants in marketing or finance. We're not accountants. Uh, what we are are, are business people. So the, the key secret sauce that we think we uh, add to business is, is the monthly board meeting, which is yep. the, the rhythm of looking holistically at your business for an hour, two hours a month, uh, having decent financial reporting. So the we start with the, the um, start with the CEO's report, just consolidating what's been happening over the last month, good and bad, that can then be communicated to the staff. We then look at financials, um, high level, p and few KPIs, some forecasting, uh, and that that we describe as this, the business scorecard, what's working, what's not working. And many accountants wait for their accountant to tell them how they did last year. Okay, There's, They've got no visibility around current performance. Sometimes I had a new client last month and I said in the middle of the following month, so what was your billings last month? He had no idea. Okay, So finance first, operations second, the efficiency, utilization, how you're using your resources within the company, uh, and then finally, sales and marketing. Do you have a decent pipeline? Have you got enough work? Have you got the the lead indicators in your business that will tell you that your sales and marketing is not up to scratch or you're not winning enough work to pay the bills and meet your budget in 
six months or a nine months time. Because architects are, in, to some extent, in a really fortunate position. They complain about not having enough work in their pipeline, but they'll tell us they've got um, 10 months work or nine months work, whatever. And I sometimes say to them, you could be in retail, you don't know who's coming in your shop tomorrow. So you've got nine months work and you're still feeling um, worried and, and concerned about the future. So the board meeting then, and then finally we do um, projects. So business improvement projects that the board needs to keep across, that keep on track. And what we say is if you take a minimum of five decisions at every board meeting each month, that's 60 a year. You're, I don't care what the decisions are, if you, if you make them with good intent, your business will transform over that 12 months period. Okay, so you're teaching them, you're pulling them out of the, 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 so the leaders of the business, the key people of the business, you're pulling them out of the, the forest, the, the day to day yep. operating, the, the doing the architectural work, putting them into a, the strategic environment, which you're going, this is the board of the business. <clears throat> We need to be focused on, you know, what's the business going to look like tomorrow, probably in, in six to 12 months time. Let's make those, dis consciously make those decisions today. Um, start with small decisions, but, but working to a plan because we've now got a plan of what the business looks like, whether it be a business plan, strategic plan, what have you. But we're going to make small bite sized changes to be consciously day to day having the, those conversations and making choices. But the key thing is the only way we can make those choices is if we've got some sort of measuring monitoring system in place that gives us visibility of what's really happening on a on a current day by day basis rather than six or 12 months behind purely from a financial. And you use the term lead indicators. Can you expand on that? What do you mean by lead indicators? <clears throat> OK, so so if I was if I was. Um an architect running an architectural practice, a, a key lead indicator for me would be like a six months rolling average of work secured because they tend to pick up work in, in lumps, big jobs, and then nothing for a, a, a time and then another big job perhaps. And th unless you've got some visibility on uh, a, a metric that you can measure each month. So we just ask them to add up how many, uh, how much work they've won in the last six months, divide by six and, and record that number record that number each month and and if, if you're not picking up enough work on that basis to cover the budget that you've set and again budget's another conversation but to cover the budget uh, income that you've set in nine months or six or nine months time then it's unlikely you're going to meet those budget numbers so that, that's what we would call a a lead indicator of what's going to happen in the future whereas a, a lag indicator which is the other term <clears throat> is how much profit did you make last month that's gone Time's passed. You can do nothing about that. You need to know that those numbers, but there is a difference between the lead and the lag okay. indicators. So financial reporting is kind of what happened, um, and and keeping score, so to speak. But what you're saying is a lead indicator is we need to be tracking the activity of what we're doing that will ensure that when we report what happened, is is what we want to have happened. Otherwise, if we just wait and see what happened, it's too late. We can't make any changes. Is is that correct? Yeah, I think that's right. We, we um, most most architectural practices that we meet have no budget, so they, they have no idea. They 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 work on a break even. We need to bill fifty grand a month to cover the costs, and that's about as far as it goes. Right. We encourage them to create a twelve month budget for the financial year, to lock that in in their accounting system, so that each month they can compare their actual performance against the um, the budget they set at the beginning. What we ask them to do then is to, as each month passes, we ask them to prepare a forecast. So the forecast then becomes uh, the actual year to date, and then the rest of the year planned out. Now, if you're an accountant, quite often you'll find it's um, actual year to date plus the budget for the rest of the year. We don't think that's such a good idea you now know things that you didn't know when you set the budget three, six, nine months ago. Uh, so your forecast needs to incorporate that knowledge. So okay. put the year-to-date actual, add in the forecast for the year, and now you know this is where we think you, we're going to end up in six or nine months' time. That still gives you time to do something about it. Yeah, so you're continually updating your forecast based on real, live, up-to-date information. <clears throat> Absolutely. Absolutely, yeah. and we, we do we do compare at a really high level 
what the new forecast looks like in comparison with the original budget. Because that means yeah. that if if you're sitting on a board, you're expected to deliver the budget. So if there's a discrepancy showing up between, let's say, the forecast year-end profit and your budgeted year-end profit, are we going to accept that or are we going to take some remedial action? Okay. So, Ray, I think you mentioned to me earlier that you work internationally. Yes, we do. Um, yeah. We have got clients now, um, Mexico, Norway, UK, and recently in we've picked up a new client in a place called Yellowknife in Canada, which is very far north. Um, and there's very um, interesting uh, operational problems for an architectural practice, but very successful business in um, in Canada. Okay, so how do you work with them? How does how does um, your business, Archibiz, engage and interact with a, with a client when, when they're overseas? I assume there's a bit of Zoom calls. Um, yep. but, but what level of detail? You, you mentioned that you, you get involved at a board level and setting the strategy, but how, how does it work working with you? What do you do? Okay, so we, we have a number of different offerings. We, we've got a, a signature online training program called Designing Architectural Practice Success, DAPS program, and we encourage all prospective clients and clients to, to take that course because that that gives them the basics that's the um the language the vocabulary of business uh, some rudimentary stuff around reporting some people think that's enough and they they stick with that some of the bigger practices say well we want more than that so they do the daps program we then do a business review uh, we interview all the staff, we interview clients, we look at websites, we look at um, fee proposals, all, all the elements of the business. And then we feed that back to the, the effectively the board of the uh, practice. At that point, again, they can say, well, that's fine, we can implement ourselves. Or, which is more typical, they engage us as business coaches. And that, that takes two forms. Um, coaching the management team or the, sometimes only the, the practice leader here herself um, and then chairing the board meeting so the the board meeting we keep coming back to that as the as the key change in the business this is now a point in time once a month where we're going to look strategically at the business using tried and tested uh, easy to prepare reporting and that that's it's a godsend for for these people because they they don't want to figure these things out for themselves they want to have the conversation but you know how do we have the conversation once a month Okay, and that that engagement can go on for uh, quite some time. We we we're not time limited. If if people want to stop, there's no contract. Um, but typically, we have long term engagements with our clients uh, on a coaching front. So you, you get involved at the strategic level. You guide them. You you help them transition their business from a, a self employed type of model into a business that uh, is is using management good management practices and 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 driving the business forward now now what happens when the founders of the business start to go well how do i get out how do i you know my i'm i'm ready to move on to something else you know how do you help do you do you, do you value the business what do you do there no we get on the phone to succession plus that's what we do and I ask for some help with the, the, the people in, in Melbourne, because we're not experts in that. And the, there's technical aspects and legal and tax aspects that we we say, no, we, we're not. We, again, we work at the high level. Do you want to try and sell the business or do you want to prepare the next level of people for a management buyout or a, a handover uh, to people that you know already? If it's, the, if it's the second scenario, we can probably help a bit. We can coach the next level. We can do some management training. In terms of the sale of the business, um, our only advice really is get your business working well, get your business making profit, get your business so it's not overly dependent on you as the owner, because you can't, we can't we can't sell you. We can sell the business, yeah. and we need something that's robust um, if you're not around. Yep. So let's make the business you know, as as dependent on the owner or the owners as little as possible, which is a slight mindset to a, to a lot of uh, professional service service type businesses, isn't it? Where where the owners or the founders are the key people for bringing business in. Yeah, I, th I think that's right. Um, but again, that's that's uh, there's always the double decker bus scenario, and, and we often ask that: What happens if Bob or Mary gets ill or knocked down by a bus? What would, how would the business survive? And quite often, the answer to that question is it wouldn't. 
the business just wouldn't survive without them. So even that realization and that spreading the load and um, spreading the relationship building and the relationship maintenance across the business, that that's how you spread the uh, reduce the risk um, and yeah. and increase the value. Yeah. So increase the 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 dependence on the processes and the systems rather than the people. Okay. Uh, absolutely. Uh, a business that um, it, and it, sometimes it's hard for architects because quite often they have their name above the door as a, an architectural practice, and that that can be a complication because um, and quite often we see architectural practices go from uh, surnames to three letters KSA or KWC or and and I think that's a good move because it, it cuts away who are these people I, I only want to deal with the boss you know all the things we we come across um, and and. That we've got to fight against so that the the value is in the business not in the relationships of the individual or even the skills of the individual okay so ray we're getting close to, to the end now and and, and you've shared a, a few tips what's the um the the biggest you know in in your experience and working with with architects uh, around the world is, is there a common theme that you work on or is there an area that you kind of look for and go hey look i always know i can add huge value here is there a key topic that you look for first? I think yes, we can we can help most businesses because most architectural practices, if if we get the right people, if somebody's coachable, we can we can show them uh, how to improve their business. And and something we've been really focusing on ourselves fairly recently <laughs> is rather than seeing what we do as fixing a problem or a, an absence of business skills, we're actually saying why don't we see business systems and processes is actually a competitive advantage, a strategic advantage. Because when you come mm -hmm. right down to it, there are many architects who can build your house or design your office. And yes, you look at the architectural websites and all you see is pictures of buildings. But if you've got a good and well-run business, that's risk mitigation for the client. There's added value there that we feel most architectural practices don't see and certainly don't capitalize on. Okay. So that, so that would be the, the one piece of advice. It would be differentiate your practice and your business beyond just the work that you do. Yeah. So sell, yeah, sell the system, not the people is, is kind of what I yeah. heard. There. All right. yeah. or, or sell, sell the systems and people, but not the product. That's, you've got to go beyond that um, picture of a building and saying to a client, do you want something that looks like this? There's a lot more to it than that. Brilliant. Because at the end of the day, the client is buying an expectation, um, a promise that you're going to be able to design the building that they love. Once they've engaged you, it's it's a concept, an idea, and they, they want confidence that you're in your ability to fulfill that vision they've got in their own head or that 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 aspiration. Yeah, absolutely. And and you, if I was looking for an architect, I would looking for an architect contextual practice that has low staff turnover, that makes a profit and is stable, uh, yeah. that communicates well with their clients, that provides a good service. Uh, and those are all over and above getting a good design for my building. That's not, that's not enough. I need more. But I think architects miss that opportunity to um, compare themselves with the com um, competitors uh, using some of these additional layers in the, in the conversation. Okay. Okay. Hey, Ray, look, I've, look you, you've shared some wonderful insights today. And, and I imagine there's, there's a number of architects that are listening to this and, and, and they're, they're going, okay, so what's the one key thing? So just by way of recap, or if it's something you haven't shared, what's the one key thing you want an architect listening to this to, to take away from our conversation today? Uh, learn about business and, and let that uh, supplement and add to your passion and your skills. Don't see it as something that's that's um, not in your area, not something that you need to be interested in. It, it's uh, business can be fun, as you know. If you if you get it right and and you're looking at the right information, uh, running a business can be fun, and, and we can get rid of some of the angst and the sleepless nights that many people have in business unnecessarily. Brilliant. Ray, thanks. Really appreciate you sharing your, your, your exit insights with us today. It's been a pleasure. Look forward to seeing you in UK at some point. <laughs>